Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Sav. And I'm Jess, and welcome to And a Diet Soda, episode 21, Sleep Stability and the REM Cycle. Hi, it's Sav and Jess. Welcome to And a Diet Soda, an opportunity for people to celebrate their successes, share their failures, and hopefully give a little advice on all things relatable along the way. This community is for appreciating the little things and fostering positive mindsets and intuitive thoughts by talking to people, because chances are they've been through it too. Today we have a sleep-centered hour for all of you. We're going to be talking about REM cycles, sleeping habits, overall health, how your eating relates to it, everything, anything that relates to sleeping. Yeah, we got Mel Azul, also known as the sleep stylist. She is certified in, are you ready for this, you guys? Because it's a mouthful. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to get through it. She is certified in sleep science, neuro-linguistic programming, and cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Wow, that is a resume. On top of that, she has her degree in broadcast journalism and extensive travels around the world to research uh, on wellness techniques and sleep treatments, and uh, which all led her to launch her podcast, The Sleep Well Around the World. So in this podcast, Mel interviews various guests, gives sleeping tips, and shares original sleep affirmations to suit different challenges and situations. She also developed programs such as Peak Sleep Blueprint and Circa DM Master to help professionals optimize their circadian rhythm balance and master their sleep for increased immunity and productivity. Mel worked as an international flight attendant for many years, and so she herself experienced constant jet lag and insomnia. After researching the best methods to address her sleep issues, she is happy to share her insights and also sh- serves as an aviation wellness consultant, which I didn't, I'm didn't. i excited to learn about, and a resource speaker. So welcome on the show, Mel. We're super happy to have you. Hello, Sav, and hi, Jess. Uh, so happy to be here. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, So we're just going to get right into it. We're really excited for this episode. Um, There's going to be so much we want to get in with this episode, but let's just start out by talking about what a sleep coach is and how you work with your clients. Sure. Well, nowadays, of course, there's something that we call Corona Somnia. Uh, well, a lot of us who are experiencing um, difficulty sleeping and also we have this hybrid work mode In fact, where you live now, around 70% of Americans are working from home. So that has caused a lot of disruption on our circadian rhythm. So it's not just traveling that causes jet lag, but there's also something that is called social jet lag, because sometimes we need to be awake at odd hours because we're communicating with someone uh, from another country because we're working from home most of the time now. And there's a lot of digital entrepreneurs now. It's um, a big thing where most of um, entrepreneurs, they're going online now. So of course it becomes a 24 seven, well, it has the potential to become a 24 seven work. So uh, you need to be careful for that too. And that's why I feel now is a very crucial time to let everyone know the importance of sleep and how it in fact consolidates your memory and helps you to become more alert and productive throughout your day. So as a sleep coach, I guide a lot of people because uh, there are several reasons why people are lacking sleep. It could be because they have shift work, It could be because they're suffering from insomnia for a prolonged period of time. And it could be uh, because they have had a post-traumatic stress disorder and there is something that is preventing them from sleep. There's something also called anticipatory anxiety. A lot of people, they may be uh, ruminating during the night and they have a lot of worries that runs through their mind. Uh, it's like on a ro- roller coaster mode, you know, it just uh, just goes around and around as a cycle and they cannot help but worry about the next day. So that also prevents them from sleeping well. So a lot of reasons are behind or at the root of why a person is having sleep deprivation. So as a sleep coach and consultant, I try to get to the bottom of that. And it's not just sleep hygiene that is the issue or the sleep routine that they go through at night, the nighttime routine that they go through. But sometimes it has something very much to do with their emotions or their associations with sleep, how they associate the bed. So sometimes there's a trauma associated with it, or sometimes 
there's a lot of anxiety associated with it and it prevents them from having the deep relaxation that is essential for helping someone for deep sleep. So I love that you went into the roots behind what causes people to to struggle with sleep too that that was a great point and and there are so many different kinds which is awesome you did mention one thing that i never heard before what is sleep hygiene all right so sleep hygiene basically is uh, the routine that you go through or a structured procedure that someone goes through before they go to bed so for everybody Every single person is unique. So everyone has a different nighttime routine that they go through that kind of leads them to that homeostatic sleep drive, wherein it leads them to becoming very, very sleepy. So everyone has a different technique or strategy for them to do it. Sleep hygiene refers to that, but it refers to refining your routine or making it more effective, maximizing and optimizing that routine so that it actually works. Because for some, they do have a sleep routine or a nighttime routine, but maybe they're not having enough self-discipline to always apply it on a regular basis. Or sometimes there's something within their routine that may not really be working for them and they're not aware of this. So that's why sleep hygiene is also part and parcel of my strategy to help someone to be able to sleep better. But I also have to stress this out. Sometimes sleep hygiene can also work against sleep. So as I said, I always customize my technique and strategy in helping clients. Uh, that's why I, I kind of... Um, I kind of referred to it as sleep stylist, as that, that is my method, because I feel that I need to personalize a strategy for each and every person. What may work for Sav may not necessarily work for Jess. So maybe for you, Jess, let's say, for example, having a sleep routine may not work for you. In fact, it may increase your anxiety because you're feeling the pressure. Of, okay, I need to do this at this time. I need to do this next. And then after that, I need to do my yoga stretches and then after that I need to put on my sleep music so you know and then that makes you so stressed so maybe sleep hygiene may not be applicable to you so I just wanted to put that in that yes sleep hygiene is a good thing but it may not be applicable to each and every person That's thank so you funny. yeah yeah, um, I, I was going to ask that too. You seem to be like reading my mind as you go through this because I was going to ask about like, what about when you want this nighttime routine and then you like end up feeling guilty or like you, that you don't do it every night or like wash my face every night. Um, so I'm glad you were like, it's not for everyone. It'll, it depends who you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I go ahead. Sorry. Oh, yeah, that's so true. That's why you shouldn't be beating yourself up for that. Uh, you know, there's that's why uh, I also engaged uh, in neuro linguistic programming strategies, because sometimes uh, it's our emotion that's preventing us to sleep. Sometimes when you're, you know, when you hit the pillow and it's dark, that's when all the negative thoughts uh, start to to come into your mind and some of that could be shame some of that could be guilt some of that could be worry or anxiety so you mentioned something about oh I didn't do this part of my routine and now you're consumed with guilt so that's why it can be counterproductive and not work for you instead of actually helping and assisting you to sleep better so that's why uh, this is why it sometimes takes time for a client to be able to realize all of the steps that they need to take to sleep better. But you know what? Uh, I also want to tell you, uh, you know, Jess, in relation to that question, that we're just humans, you know, we're not perfect. So every night you're not going to sleep perfectly deeply for seven to nine hours. So you can't beat yourself up for that. Otherwise, you're going to accumulate this bad association with sleep. I just want to stress that sleeping is a gift. You know, it's part of our biological function and it helps us to be more healthy and alert. So, you know, babies, they don't have sleep problems. Why? Because they don't have any worries about sleep. You know, as we go through adulthood, we start having these negative associations. And that's why something that is very, very natural has become something that is disruptive for us because of the negative associations that 
we put into it, when in fact, Sleep is something natural. It's part of our biological clock, something which is called our circadian rhythm, which di dictates a 24 hour cycle of being asleep and being awake. It is natural. Sleeping actually helps us to be more alert when we're awake. So it's a gift of nature to us. It's a gift from above. So if we view it that way, we're not going to be so consumed with pressure and stress. Like, oh, I need to sleep this much. Sleep is natural. Look at babies. Just look at how babies sleep. They sleep deeply and uh, they have even breathing when they're sleeping. And that's just the way it is. So we shouldn't really put a lot of no negative connotations on sleeping. I need to do a lot of backtracking. I need to do a lot of reverse engineering when I'm helping my clients, in fact, because you need to go back basically to just being natural and just erasing all of those negative connotations that you've accumulated through the years regarding sleep. Awesome. I sleep like a baby personally, <laughs> literally, but it was because of, it was because of years of education and interest in circadian rhythm. So that actually leads me into my question for you, which is what is your story as far as what led you to be interested in sleep and circadian rhythm? And also thank you for defining circadian rhythm for those of who listening, who might not know what that is, but I feel like somebody this interested in, in sleeping and circadian rhythm has to have a solid story as to what guy, why you're so interested in sleep. So we just want to hear a little bit about that and also probably being like a flight attendant. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I do love traveling. It's one of my greatest passions and that's what led me to becoming a flight attendant. And uh, because I had to operate international flights, that uh, just completely disrupts your rhythm because I also have to explain about circadian rhythm. It also has, of course, a great deal to do with night and day. So if you're constantly flying across various time zones and your even your uh, appetite is being uh, disrupted because sometimes it's nighttime, but you feel like you want to have eggs and toast, you want to have breakfast it completely can disrupt your biological clock. And I, I was flying for at least two decades. And uh, that is really what completely messed up my cycle. And I myself felt how it affected me, not just my health, my immunity, but also my relationships, you know, uh, because it suffers and also your health because you're not sleeping well, your day becomes severely affected and uh, you're basically moody uh, sometimes your memory uh, is not consolidated well enough you're not alert and it can also cause accidents physically so it's basically not really safe to do it but even while I was flying I did a lot of research so I looked at sleep, not just from a physiological perspective, but also from a cultural and behavioral one, because I was flying to different countries and I was seeing firsthand how different cultures would apply wellness techniques to help them sleep better. So for example, in Thailand, they apply sound therapy. In Bali, they apply color therapy or a chromo chromotherapy. Uh, in India, they also do Ayurveda. So a lot of natural things that I started getting into and I started researching, which I found out really helps us to sleep better. So I realized that some of things we cannot control. I still love flying. So I didn't want to just quit so I could sleep better. I thought that I could still continue with doing what I love, but still incorporating good strategies, good techniques, so that I can uh, be able to beat my insomnia. So after doing a lot of research and uh, looking at sleep also from a neurological perspective, seeing how the brain functions if we sleep better and how we can basically hack or do biohacking so that we can do certain things and apply certain strategies to sleep better, then I realized that, hey, I can actually do this. It's not gonna be perfect, but it is actually possible to deal and beat jet lag.
Yeah, I'm laughing because Jess just typed in America, we do Tylenol PM therapy. It's so okay. awful. Amer yeah, we in America okay. don't have the best sleep patterns. That's for sure. <laughs> um, we have that's a question. Fantastic, though. Yeah, it's so true. Well, you know, you guys spend uh, billions, uh, literally billions of dollars annually on sleep medicine. So can you imagine how much you can save from it? And on the topic of sleep medication as well for that uh, Tylenol therapy you're talking about, uh, I just want to say that it can work. And uh, I, I'm not going to be all goody two shoes and say, oh, I've never taken. Sleep. I mean, come on, I've taken my uh, occasional melatonin, <laughs> my occasional still knocks and my occasional Tylenol as well. Yeah. So yes, I mean, Sometimes you need to take that just to get yourself back on track. But if you take it for a prolonged period of time, it has, of course, this addictive um, function inside the medication. And suddenly you're going to find that you're addicted to it and then you can't sleep without it. And here's the thing. There's another thing that is called sleep disruption, uh, which is you have taken, for example, your Tylenol. What happens if after three hours, you suddenly wake up. What are you going to do now, right? Or you, you don't want to take another Tylenol to put you to sleep. So sometimes it will knock you out within a few minutes, but then it doesn't take care of your sleeping deeply through the night. So that's why uh, if you want to take it because of jet lag, you can by all means, but maybe on the first and second day. And on the third day, you need to already start applying natural strategies to get your body back on track. So you're not taking it on a daily basis. That's, that's a good point too. And there's also something referred to as drug tolerance where your body will get used to it and, and lose that, you know, heightened effect over time. So, um, as far as melatonin goes, I took a circadian rhythms class and we learned a lot about things like melatonin and actually how less amounts of melatonin actually work better. So can you explain that a little bit as to why, you know, you don't want to take like five milligrams of melatonin, why you maybe want to take like one or two grams of melatonin and why that might work better? Yeah. Uh, well, the less is better because then your body also has its own natural melatonin function because melatonin is a hormone in our body that is responsible for making us uh, feel sleepy and staying in a deep sleep mode during the night. So you just want to kickstart your own melatonin secretion during the night, right? So if you're always taking melatonin and taking it in uh, large doses, then that is not going to help you really in the long run, because you're disrupting your own melatonin production. So I just also want to state that with regards to melatonin, it also has to, it is intrinsically linked also with your serotonin levels. So you need to understand that if you're just taking melatonin and you're, you're not addressing what you're doing throughout the day, then you're not really doing yourself 100% of a favor that you should be doing. Because our body has a its own melatonin secretion. It's a hormone in our body and it works with our circadian rhythm, with our serotonin. So a little bit, I wanted to explain how it links with our circadian rhythm because circadian rhythm basically is part of our biological clock function so that we're not just staying awake, sleeping through the night, but we are staying awake during the day. So this is what a lot of people forget about sleeping, how it is very much linked to what we do in the daytime. So in the daytime, we want to expose ourselves to as much sunlight as possible. In fact, the moment you wake up, I highly suggest that if you can open your window, because sometimes people sleep with a blackout curtain, if you can open your window and expose yourself to sunlight, that will help you to get your vitamin D, of course, and also your uh, serotonin, which is your, which is the hormone that, um, you know, makes you happy and also is the hormone that uh, also regulates the melatonin in our body. So if you're doing um, good uh, habits, you're implementing good habits and a good routine during the day, then that helps you to sleep better at night. Whereas some people, they love to nap, let's say two hours during the day. Then at nighttime, that disrupts their sleep severely because the sleep drive is already gone. So that's why it's so important that melatonin works with serotonin. 
our melatonin has to work with what we do throughout our day. So that's why it is a sleep-wake cycle. People forget and just concentrate on sleep and separate it from what we do throughout our day. And that's why I always stress that circadian rhythm is a 24 hour thing. It could refer to sleeping for eight hours and our awake time of 16 hours. What you do during that 16 hour period is very, very important and will impact the quality of your eight hour sleep. So it's not just about taking melatonin and then sleeping. No, it, you also need to be watchful of what you are doing throughout the day so that you can sleep better at night. Awesome. So I would also love to hear about um, like what a REM cycle is and, and like what that means for the body. So I just wanted to go through that as well with you so that people can understand that REM or the rapid eye movement stage of sleep is the most recuperative part of sleep. And that's why uh, Sad to say, those who are only getting around six to eight hours of sleep are really not having the full benefits of the REM stage of sleep. So the first two stages, stage one and stage two, is light sleep. It is the non-rapid eye movement stages of sleep. Some people say that there's a fifth stage, which is at the beginning. So you can say that too, so as not to confuse people. It is your drowsy stage. Sometimes it's that five to 10 minutes before you actually fall asleep. You know, you're feeling drowsy. So you're half asleep, half awake at that time. But uh, technically, sleeping is when you're already unconscious, right? Like even the, the slightest sound will not wake you up anymore. So that will be the start of the stages of sleep. So the first two stages is non-REM or the light stage of sleep. The third stage is uh, starting on the deep sleep already. So you're in uh, delta waves mode. We're in, um, this is the part that's very, very important too, because this part is, the brain is not only consolidating the memory, all the things that you've learned through the day. So for example, you studied for an exam, or you're trying to memorize something for a presentation the next day. This part is very, very essential for you because this part is when you're already consolidating your memory, the body temperature goes down and uh, you're sleeping very, very deeply at this stage. And the best thing about it is not only the memory function, but it has a function for our emotions as well. We are regulating our emotions at this stage. So sometimes if we've gone through a very stressful situation through the day, this is the part when we're recuperating from that situation, that we are recovering from that situation. So if you notice when you've had a very good sleep, the next day you have a very uplifted mood. And sometimes whatever stressful situation occurred the day before, a few days before, you're dealing with it more effectively. You're dealing with it more confidently because you went through the, that recuperative part of sleep. Now let's go to the fourth stage of sleep, which is the most important. You were mentioning REM, which is rapid eye movement. This is when we start having the dreams. It could also involve the lucid dreaming or creative dreaming. This stage is very important because it is the recuperative stage. And our brain has an amazing, miraculous function that scientists have only recently discovered a few decades ago. All along, people thought that the brain is just completely dormant during sleep, especially during this REM stage of sleep. In fact, it is the opposite. The brain is actually function, has a housekeeping function during this stage of sleep. And it's called the glymphatic system. It is when all of the toxins that accumulated in our brain is being washed out. So whatever, so actually, if you think about it, these studies have also linked neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and dementia. Now they have been closely linked to lack of sleep because sad to say, those who are not sleeping the required seven to nine hours for adults to sleep are not getting the benefits of this REM stage of sleep. And that's why sometimes uh, whatever is accumulated in the brain, the toxin is not being flushed out. 
Yeah. I, I mean, that's, I'm definitely one of those people that like will totally get the ner- the urge to nap. Like right after work, I'll get really tired. I'll be like, I just need to lay down for like an hour, turns into two hours. And then, so I guess what I'm asking is like, when we feel that urge, so I have two questions. One, when we feel that urge to like lay down, take a nap, is there anything that you recommend to your clients where you're like, do this and it'll wake you up a little bit more, or you can do this to avoid it. Or is it more of just like a push through that feeling kind of thing? And then I'm wondering, that must play a huge role in mental and physical health when you do nap, when your circadian rhythm is off. Um, So then after, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, definitely. Uh, of course, napping is very, very in- essential. In fact, in a lot of um, work environments, for example, in Japan, there are some companies where they have sleeping pods for the employees. And that is really, really good. It's a very good start to help the employees to be more productive in the afternoon. Because sometimes what people love to do is they over caffeinate. They drink lots and lots of coffee throughout the day to keep them awake. And uh, that actually can also be counterproductive to you because after that buzz, you know, it's like being intoxicated, but without, (laughs) you know, the buzz of being intoxicated, you're just intoxicated and kind of you, um, you know, you can't really think straight or you're, you're too hyperactive as well. So you need to also be aware and be careful of your caffeine intake because caffeine also has this half life. So sometimes uh, that amount of caffeine, maybe for example, if you drink two cups of coffee, it, the, the caffeine has a half-life and can stay in your body. It could last for around 10 hours. So for example, you took your coffee at three in the afternoon. Around 12 midnight, you're still not gonna be sleepy normally. But there are some people who are exceptionally, uh, I can say blessed because they can drink coffee I don't know if you know some, but I have a few friends who do that. But they're the exception to the rule. They drink coffee half an hour before bed and boom, they can still sleep. So, Sav. <laughs> oh my gosh, coffee is not a thing. I wish that, if that is a talent people would pay for. <laughs> Honestly, you know. I think that I just like metabol- like metabolize things very quickly, especially caffeine. So I guess, yeah, it's totally lucky. <laughs> yeah. So um, I do suggest uh, if you're really, really feeling sleepy, uh, hopefully if it's before 2 p.m., then go ahead and have a uh, cup of coffee. If you want to just have the flavor, then go decaffeinated. But of course, the uh, coffee uh, blocks the adenosine receptors, which, you know, helps us to feel more alert as well. So uh, drinking coffee is one of the benefits and one of the suggestions that I can say. And by all means, nap. That's why some companies are already putting these sleeping pods so that I want to go to Japan. I want to work in Japan. (laughs) I want to, I want to sleep pod. (laughs) And like how in Spain, they literally have like um, siestas. Yeah. I'm like, I need that. I need to work at a place that allows naps. (laughs) Yeah. And if you look at those in Spain, uh, yeah. When I went there last time, you know, you have that uh, two uh, two to three hours where well, you don't have to maximize it and sleep for the two hours, but some people sleep for that time and then relax and then super energized in the afternoon. And if you see, they're always in the tapas bars, even at 11 p.m. and they're booming yeah. with so much energy. So it's like they have a second round of their day. Isn't that amazing? Yes. I know. <laughs> it's amazing. Day, so napping is good. Napping is very, very good because your alertness that you have in the morning you're going to have that in the afternoon if you nap, if you do your power nap. So imagine having a second round and being that alert for twice your day. You're maximizing your productivity, definitely. No, you're so right. You're so right. Um, That makes me feel better that you say I can nap though. Um, (laughs) So I want to get back to that, um, the mental health and physical health question that I had asked you because like, like I said, like I imagine it just takes a huge toll on people if they're not sleeping well with their mental health. And if I'm sure they're not going to the gym, if they're tired and it just kind of snowballs from there. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk about, yeah, both physical and mental. So mentally, uh, as I was uh, mentioning also, the brain function when we're sleeping is to regulate our emotions. So it really helps us to be able to, uh, to be able to deal well with our problems. As I said, um, there could be a lot of cognitive decline resulting in a lack of sleep. 
And if we are not mentally alert, uh, then we are not really uh, having that capacity to deal well with stressful situations that may come our way. So there's no perfect day. There are a lot of sources of anxiety, but that anxiety can be very much reduced if you're sleeping well, because you will notice that it has a direct correlation with your mood. If you're uplifted, if you're feeling positive, if you're feeling more confident and self-fulfilled, it is easier for you to be able to face your problems confidently and efficiently and, of course, successfully. But if you're not sleeping well, that will definitely compromise your ability to do that. On a physical level, I also want to stress that uh, there are hormones called ghrelin and leptin uh, linked to our appetite. So lack of sleep have also proven studies to show that lack of sleep can lead to obesity. Why? Because these two hormones of ghrelin and leptin, which are actually responsible for regulating our appetite. So for example, you're lacking sleep. What happens to you, for example, 12 midnight and you're still not sleeping? You start craving snacks. You start craving at odd hours of the night, comfort food. And what comfort food do you think you're going to crave at 12 midnight? It's not going to be a salad. It's, it's, sugar. Not going to be a salad. <laughs> it's definitely it's going to be you what it's not going to be a protein shake. Burritos and Cheetos, <laughs> right? So that's what happens. And that's natural. And some would even go for a huge pizza. <laughs> I mean, that's what you definitely start craving. And here's the thing. For example, you didn't sleep well. You only slept for five to six hours. Logically, I want to ask you or ask yourself, are you going to feel like you want to work out in the gym the next day? Do you feel like you want to go for a two hour hike? Most likely you're going to say, oops, cancel that. <laughs> No, thanks. I'm just so drowsy. I'm not, I can't even keep my eye open. How could I possibly feel like I want to go to the gym? So definitely intrinsically, it is linked with your physical well-being if you are not sleeping well. So also when it comes to appetite, um, Dr. Michael Bruce has come up with a study. He's, he's called as a sleep doctor. We can go for four days without water before it severely affects us physically. We could go for six days without sleep, but we could go for 25 days without food. So if you look at it that way, what is more important, food or sleep? You can last 25 days without food, but you can only last six days without sleep. That's that gives how me anxiety thinking about all of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's why Wait, all I hear right now is that you're me. asking me to choose between <laughs> napping and, and my snacks. And yeah. <laughs> I don't think I could ever and choose. And your diet soda. <laughs> and the diet soda. <laughs> oh, um, man. So I'm really glad that you started to bring nutrition into it. And I really want to get back to that, um, like, right after this. But I just have this, this random question that, that I just thought of. So when I, I know I'm not alone in this because, like, this happens so often is that, like, you you wake up at, like, 6 a.m. and maybe your alarm is to go off at seven and you wake up at six and you're like, I have energy, but I'm in bed. I'm comfy. I'm going to nap for another hour. And then you wake up and you're like, what year is it? So is waking up before your alarm, even if it hasn't been like a full seven to nine hours, is that your body telling you that you're ready to get up or should you still go for those hours? Uh, more often than not, if it happens more than one day, for example, it's happening um, on a day-to-day -day basis or very, very frequently for you, then yes, definitely listen to your body. Our body is the best indicator of how long and at what time we should sleep. So we all have our ideal uh, sleep, um, I can say our ideal sleeping time. So that's why we have these so-called larks. Uh, or those who are um, owls, or those who are sleeping through the night, or those who are morning persons. We all have our different ideal uh, sleep-wake cycle. So for example, you're frequently waking up at 6 a.m., then that is your body telling you that that is your ideal wake-up time. So you can backtrack and start sleeping around 10 p.m. If your body is telling you that 6 a.m. is an ideal time for you to function optimally. 
But for example, it just happened once. And because maybe it was a noise outside, a banging noise that kind of woke you up. I can suggest that there's a lot of music that you can listen to, uh, binaural beats, delta waves, or sleeping music. Some of us are attracted to nature sounds. You can put that on. And um, there are a lot of apps out there that are free, or there are a lot of channels that you can check on YouTube. They are um, sleeping channels, relaxing channels, and uh, they will provide this kind of music or uh, beats that are designed to help you fall back into a deep sleep. So you can try that if you feel you're still groggy and you don't yet want to wake up. You, you can tell if there, it's still not enough. Then you can try and get back to sleep. That's not a problem. <laughs> but um, I highly suggest that if it's happening frequently, um, try not to press the snooze button and just get yeah. up. That is the ideal time for your body to wake up. And also if you are also frequently, the other extreme is if you're frequently pressing the snooze button, that will dictate again your day. And again, it will disrupt your sleep cycle because you're always gonna be procrastinating, delaying, oh, I'll do that later. Cause you started your day kind of on the wrong foot. So, you know, as I said, we're not perfect. Fine, if you wanna press the snooze button, every now and then, but try not to do it regularly because it's going to dictate your whole, uh, you know, uh, psychology or your emotion or your attention span for the rest of the day. You're going to keep procrastinating because you started the day on that. No. Yeah. yeah, that's <laughs> true. So thank you for that. Um, let's bring it back to our overarching thing of our podcast, which is nutrition. So we want to know how nutrition plays a role in what you sleep. And you've kind of talked about the ghrelin and the leptin, um, but kind of how important it is to eat these good things, to eat these, you know, nutritious foods and how that helps us sleep. But also um, we want to know the things that most negatively impact our sleep. So what kind of foods would not allow us to sleep? You know, we talked about caffeine, obviously sugar, but um, whatever you want to go into there, just kind of dive into the nutrition aspect behind sleep. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of uh, food and drinks that can impact sleep, uh, both positively and negatively. One of the most negative things uh, are alcohol. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't want to be the, <laughs> the bad guy here, but um, I, like, I also like my wine. I like my Prosecco. I like my Rosé. But um, there's a time that is ideal for you to have it. If you're having it too close to your bedtime, then that's going to cause you to be severely dehydrated. And that could cause you to have um, nocturia, which is this phenomenon that happens during the night when you keep getting up and you need to go to the toilet and it disrupts your sleep because you could be getting up two to three or even four times per night because you know you feel like you need to go to the toilet because you drank so much water before you went to sleep. On the other hand, you're waking up because your throat is so dry and you need to drink water because you uh, consumed alcohol maybe an hour before bedtime. So I always suggest if you really want to have, you know, some alcohol, do social drinking, lunchtime is actually very, very good to have it. And even brunch, you know, your mimosas, your uh, morning glory. Sorry, I'm, I'm laughing. I'm just, I'm going to take that <laughs> up and show it to my boss and be like, it's perfect time to <laughs> drink let's all go get margaritas <laughs> you know you know where i want to live i would want to live in italy uh they actually drink wine for breakfast oh. in some parts of italy we should go there <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's, yeah, let's yeah really uh they do that and uh, they drink it for breakfast and i think that's pretty smart <laughs> to do and uh, also in Europe like in uh, for example in Switzerland in Germany in Spain if you go for some uh, breakfast buffets or breakfast restaurants they will also serve you sparkling wine so uh, actually it's a good idea to do that rather than uh, the extreme of drinking it too close to bedtime because that will disrupt your bedtime the other thing that can disrupt your bedtime is spicy dishes because that makes you very, very alert. That makes it boom. It's just like, whoo, you know, you're, you're, you're gonna be super alert. So eating very, very spicy dishes too close to bedtime will also disrupt your sleep. On the other hand, there are certain dishes that's gonna help you to sleep. Cherries, cherries 
are very, very good. One of the top things I can recommend. Try it tonight and you'll Why? see the result. Try it tonight. <laughs> Try the cherry. Like acid? Yeah. Uh, there's something in the cherry that um, makes us to sleep better. Also, the tryptophan? Banana. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, that's it. And um, also banana mm. can help you. Avocado can also help you. And nuts nuts so instead of snacking on those chips that sometimes it's like oh you know you're craving that salty thing why don't you go for almonds walnuts macadamia these are very very good to actually prepare you for that restful um, mode and it increases the sleep drive so that you can sleep faster rather than you know tossing and turning so those and are I the things that you can consume I think a lot of people too love the crunchy aspect of snacks. So I think that that's a great option too. If you're like, I, when I say people, I mean me, like I love <laughs> chips, um, but it's mostly like the crunch. Like if I can eat like carrots and hummus or nuts or something that just like has the crunch, even like a cucumber, like I just have to like have something to be able to like have that. Um, so we've taken up so much time already from you, but I want to ask um, one more question before we announce the challenge. As far as morning light and how that plays a role in our circadian rhythm, we are, we're going to have to do episode two of this. There's so much to talk about with sleep, but um, I want to talk about like, I literally have my like light box that sits on my desk for those days for the people who can't get out and sit out in the mornings for like 30 minutes to an hour, or they have to go to work, or maybe the sun's not even up yet. What are some options that you typically recommend for people to get in their morning light? Well, of course, you need to be exposed to natural light as soon as possible, as I mentioned, so that uh, that will um, restart your day. And uh, that will reset also your biological clock. Because internally, when you see day internally, you're going to know that, okay, it's daytime. So it's time for me to be awake. Also at nighttime, a lot of us sometimes are still on our laptops, you know, we're still having a lot of screen time and that blue light or LED light emanating from our devices can severely disrupt also the production of melatonin. So that one is actually a big obstacle to melatonin, which what helps you sleep. So if you I will, I will also recommend that you wear the glasses so that it can block the blue light if you really, really need to. But I recommend do something more relaxing, such as reading a book, listening to music, um, listening to affirmations, talking to someone you love, you know, doing something relaxing as opposed to doing something that can, you know, get you more agitated or get you more excited or energetic. So we really need to be mindful of um, what we're exposing ourselves to. So uh, that can also be connected to people who have to do shift work or people who are, um, you know, maybe as a consequence of their careers, they maybe have to be exposed to jet lag. So, uh, well, for example, both of you, you're in the United States. So for example, uh, you need to fly from LA and you wanna visit me here in Hong Kong. So, um, for example, if you're flying from L.A. to Hong Kong, for example, you're flying at night. Your arrival in Hong Kong will be daytime. So basically, you've skipped a night. You've skipped two time zones. So you also need to be aware of that. So if you're flying from L.A. and going to Asia, then I highly suggest that you sleep in the plane. <laughs> You try to stay awake before your flight and then you sleep as, um, as well and as much as you can while you're on the plane so that when you arrive in Asia, in Hong Kong in the daytime, instead of sleeping and completely disrupting your, um, your circadian rhythm, then uh, you are exposing yourself to sunlight as soon as you get to Asia. Because some people is, oh, I'm tired, I'm groggy, I'm going to put the blackout curtains on and I'm just going to sleep and that is already going to cause you jet lag from day one so that's why as I said expose yourself to sunlight eat breakfast try to adapt also your appetite your eating habit to your new time zone on the other hand if you're flying the opposite direction it's the other thing because for example you're leaving Hong Kong you're departing Hong Kong at 
night. Sometimes you can arrive in some if it, if it's LA, if it's New York, you can arrive also at night. So if you're sleeping in the plane, then when you get to your new time zone in the US at night, then you're gonna be wide awake and all the shops are gonna be closed and you don't wanna be roaming the streets at two in the morning, <laughs> trying to tire yourself out to be sleepy. So in this case, you should try to sleep before your flight, before you depart. And in the plane, watch a movie, try to keep yourself awake so that when you arrive at your destination and it's nighttime, you're going to feel so sleepy and tired after you're back, going through baggage collection, going through, uh, you know, the airport stress. You're going to be super tired. So when you arrive at night, check it at your hotel or, or drive back home, you're going to feel naturally sleepy. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Those are all that's, that's great. Um, the, I feel like that's, you have such amazing advice for people that travel for a living. What what like resonated with me is when you were like, when you have to do things in the middle of the night and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm just like having flashbacks to my internship when like middle of the night treatments and you're, and I work with animals. And so not only is it a treatment, it's like wrestle an animal and give the treatment <laughs> at like 3 a.m. and then you're all hyped. And I remember asking my older brother, who's a police officer, I was like, what do you do to calm down after a shift? Because like, I'm jazzed right now and it's the middle of the night and I can't sleep. So I tried like tea and I never really figured it out either because it wasn't a consistency in my life only for those six months. So I still don't know. <laughs> oh, well, uh, one thing I can suggest for you or for anyone who may be in a similar situation is to regulate your breathing. Because one thing, if our heartbeat is uh, beating so strongly and uh, our breathing is irregular, then that, that is a very big preventative um, reason already for having a deep sleep or falling into sleep. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine, as you said, you're in hyperactive mode and you have a lot of thoughts running through your head. It's not easy to relax. So I always recommend uh, four, seven, eight. So basically you inhale through your um, nose for four seconds, you hold it for seven seconds, and then you breathe, uh, you exhale, you exhale out of your mouth for eight seconds. And you will immediately, immediately feel that your heartbeat is already starting to be more regulated and slowing down so four, seven, eight, it's a simple step. And if you go through that for maybe three to several times at night, you will find that your body literally relax. Your tense shoulders literally relax. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel it. So that's what a lot of people forget. Breathing is a very, very basic function, but we forget because we're not consciously breathing properly that helps lead us into sleep. So that's one of the things that you can already do tonight that we can uh, tell our, our listeners. It's something that they can apply already, the four, seven, eight technique. So hopefully whatever happens to your day, however busy you are, uh, after the interview, you can still find a good way to sleep better tonight. I love it. Great, thank you. Yeah. Well, so we just want to kind of bring back full circle, give a little summary of everything. What we've learned today from Mel is to really utilize sleep to not only feel restful and feel rejuvenated, but also to allow our brain to perform optimally, to allow our body to function, to utilize our nutrition, to also you know, help with our mental health, help with being able to get those restful sleep patterns. So um, this leads perfectly into our weekly challenge, which Mel is going to announce. Um, every week we do a weekly challenge for our listeners and viewers, something that's easy and attainable. And this week is amazing because I know a lot of people struggle with it. So Mel, if you could go ahead and announce that challenge for us. Okay, here is the challenge, everybody. What we usually do is we eat too close to our bedtime. So this challenge is gonna <laughs> help you to sleep better if you apply it. So here it is. Two to three hours before you go to sleep, have your dinner or have the last meal of the day. Avoid having the snacks. Have your last meal two to three hours before bed. And you can do this for the next three to five days. And if you do it, I can guarantee you are going to have a better sleep this week. 
Amazing. Thank you so much. I'm excited to give that a shot. And I know Jess is as well. <laughs> yeah, I definitely am. Um, Sab, do you want to mention anything before we get off about the, I thought you were really excited about like the sleep brain connection and kind of wanted to talk about that a little bit. What are you thinking? <laughs> I see. Um, yeah. I, I think I'm going to do, I'll do the TikTok for her week on this, something okay. separate. Okay. I have an idea for it. So cool. Yeah. It's, it's so Mel, we have enjoyed having you on here so much. I can't even believe how much we fit into just over an hour. I mean, this is people spend their lives researching and learning about this. There are majors in college on this. I mean, it is like Stab said, she took several courses on it. So the fact that we were able to pack in so much information in just an hour is fantastic. So I hope that we can do um, a part two episode and stay connected with you. But it's really been a pleasure chatting with you and learning about such a unique topic. And we hope that the advice that you gave will help to inspire people to take priority in their sleep patterns and live like a healthier and more productive lifestyle. I am so happy to help even in a small way and uh, hopefully the audience, even if they apply two to three of the several things that we mentioned today, I know that they will greatly be able to improve their sleep. So thank you so much for having me on. It's been a privilege to chat with you girls. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed how we were able to, this is a huge topic and there's so much science behind it. So I really appreciate just getting down to you know, layman's terms and bringing it in and making it more attainable. So for our listeners, you can find Mel on Instagram at sleep stylist. You can learn about everything that she does. If you're interested in working with her, maybe you're thinking about, you know, needing to better your sleep a little bit. Um, also give her podcast a listen. If you're interested, that's sleep well around the world. Um, you can also find more info on her Instagram page with that as well. So to become a part of our family and community, join us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, all the places uh, at Anna Diet Soda. Thanks again, Mel, and we will see you all next week. Thanks for listening. We hope you were able to give yourself a little love today. You deserve it. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and check us out on social media for weekly conversations and attainable challenges for your health.